folks, welcome inside the wow. Parisi Palace, high above 3773 East Broadway. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. Company on Power Talk, thank you so much for making us part of your day today. Aspiration, in its simplest definition, is a lovely flame climbing heavenward. True aspiration can and does make us feel that if God is for us, who can eventually stand against us? We feel a desire to have God on our side, but we need the aspiration to throw ourselves on God's side. The sun is the only remedy for the dark clouds in the sky. Similarly, there is no other medicine than aspiration for our troubled hearts. Aspiration is the first rung of the sky-kissing ladder. Realization is the last. True human aspiration has three intimate friends, purification, quietude, and intensity. Aspiration is an enemy called impatience. Aspiration is the mounting flame of our divine wish to raise ourselves to the crest and crowning of divine perfection. The body aspires through action. The vital aspires through struggles. The mind aspires through self-search. The heart aspires through the feeling of union. The soul aspires through the perfection of God's manifestation. Dave Buskin, an honor to welcome you to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thank you, Jake. What? That was a great reading. Do you do that every day? Well, I, and that's and then again, that that actually came from the great teacher uh, Sri Chimnoy. And uh, uh, I, you know, I mean, it is so cosmic to have connected with you for a variety of reasons. But I did, I, you know, I, I really wanted to just start by asking you about when you learned to get out of your own way. And allow the music to come through you, as because you are a con, you're a conduit for music coming through you from the heavens. So I, I mean, and it's very hard for sure. a lot of cats to get out of their own way. And I was hoping you could talk about when when that happened for you. I would be happy to, um, but but first, I just want to interpose a note. When that when you started playing that song, yeah, this is this is a little preview of what you got in store for you when you get older, Jake. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, dude, I, go ahead. Yeah, what did you think? Music. Yeah. And I, and I was thinking, oh, that, I like this song. I forget who it is, though. <laughs> and I'm embarrassed to ask him. Um, uh, maybe it was his looking glass. No, that doesn't sound like Elliot's voice. I know it's around then. <laughs> and then I realized it was my late friend Jeff Kenton was Pierce Arrow, and, and I was singing and playing on it. I said, I, dude, oh it, you God. know, I'm just getting hip to Pierce Arrow. There's like on Wolfgang's vault, rest in peace, Bill Graham, there's like all these incredible live shows from the bottom line in New York City. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you were playing with two of my guys, two, two, I mean, I'm 43, but like the two cats yeah, that well, I obsessed. I'm older than that. No, you're fine, <laughs> You're, but you're like, you're, you're, young, you're young at heart. But the thing is, like Doug Lubon and, and Kent were both in my, my dear friends, Randy Brecker and Billy Cobbman, Dreams. Dreams. Oh, my yeah, God. Sure. Mind-blowing Bob Mann was – so, I mean, like, it's all – like, just to connect with you, man, like, I – I uh, so, yeah, that was Pierce Arrow, and I am just now getting hit to that group, and I am fired up to get into it, man. I love – I mean, it, it has, but, like, a radio-friendly vibe, but I it still grooves, you know? Well, sadly – Half that band died. I mean, Doug Jeez. is dead. Um, Doug is Jeff dead, too? died of cancer. Oh. Yeah, Doug died, I think, two or three years ago. I don't know of what. But uh, Jeff's gone. Um, and then Bobby Chenard, the drummer, um, who was one of the sweetest cats I ever knew, died young, um, which wasn't a surprise to those of us who knew him because every bad habit that was created, Bobby was the poster boy for. <laughs> um, and he but, was not um, the only one. Good, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. no, but he had a good time. He did have a good time, and it was amazing because the one motor facility that never was impaired by all of the stuff he put into his body was his ability to keep time rock solid. Oh my god, dude, so, he could um, swing. I mean, I I'm just getting into. I mean, I anyway. I mean, you, you know, being humble. I I just I feel like there's a lot of cats, Dave, that you know as they were they might have all the gold records in the world or they might have played the guitar solos on stuff and then and they have all the toys they need and and as they get older um the phone stops ringing as much and they get bitter and resentful because they feel like they were fully responsible for what came out of their apparatus or their voice when in fact they're only partially responsible for it because 
the really magical cats are conduits to the music. I just wanted you that's, to talk well, about that philosophy. Yeah. You know how you. Okay, yeah. I would. I'd be happy to. Um, you know, with me, it's it's part with the writing and part with the practicing. I mean, I said to my, I've been taking guitar lessons for about ten years from a great jazz player named Joe Chilio, oh. and um, I, you know, we were talking about music. We talk a lot about obviously about musicians, and I mean, he's he's uh, he's studied with masters, and. Um, I said, you know what makes me a musician? What makes me a musician is every day when I sit down and practice the guitar. When I do that, I'm a musician. You know, um, it has nothing to do with any of the, you know, the peripheral stuff. Uh, any of the reasons I went into it to get money and to get girls. Um, right. You know, <laughs> you say when did I when did I get out of my own way? Well, it's an ongoing process. I don't. I can't say that I am out of my own way. But uh, um, you, you keep re- I, I, what what it, the effect that it's had on me is to make me more interdirected, more private. The musician part is making the music and writing writing the music. Like sometimes I'll be writing a lyric or something, or I'll be writing, I'll be stuck on something, and maybe you go to sleep and you wake up and you got the answer. And I think, where the hell did that come from? And and you know, it's just, I don't, I don't, I don't want to sound immodest, but sometimes I say, I can't believe I wrote that. That's a really good line. And, um, you know, it, it, you just do it to do it. That's, that's the true religion of it. And I think that's something that all musicians share to a degree, but it's easy to have your, your vision deflected by all of the hoopla surrounding it. I mean, when I was a kid, I didn't know nothing about nothing. And, and uh, it took me a long time to learn a couple of things. First of all, that it probably wasn't helpful to be a drunk um, <laughs> to your ability to create music. That took about 30 years. And then also, you know, like when you're a kid and you have some talent, everybody tells you how good you are, your family and your friends. And what you've got to realize is it's like when you get to college and everybody else in the freshman class was also their class president in high school. That's right. Everybody's got, everybody's got talent. It's not about talent. It's about you know, there's a story maybe apocryphal about Pablo Casals, who was asked why in his 90s he was still practicing. And he said, because I think I'm beginning to get it. I love this and, stuff. Uh, you're, you're, it's, yeah. it's a constant journey. It's the forever journey. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. I, I think like, like that, yeah. it's so interesting to hear you say that. I mean, would you say that... Um, I mean, could you point to a time like early, even at Brown or, or you know, like when... <laughs> you know, I remember... Paul Jackson, the great bass player from uh, Herbie's The Headhunters mm-hmm. Band, and he, uh, I interviewed him, rest in peace, and he, he I was asking him about some of the, because they kind of did the first real crossover music that at least got relatively mm-hmm. popular, wouldn't be considered, you know, traditional jazz by any means, but he, he said that... Right. He said that stuff would fall out during the the music, like it would just come out. You know, it's like writing. Yeah. Where, you, like you said, where sure. the hell did that come from? And like that's yeah. the and I, and like to but to embrace the unknown, to embrace that is the key because a lot of people want to control things. They don't. They fear the unknown, or they get insecure, or they start questioning themselves. Stan Getz, I worked on a a documentary that never got off the ground, but I did about four dozen interviews, and he never knew. How, where his beautiful sound came from and it drove him mad and he was already a, <laughs> a, kind of a sociopathic cat but it was like you know i mean dude you know it's you know and at, at a certain point um like do you remember like just getting off the bandstand at some coffee house in brown like where you're just like or, or you heard the tape back the next day and you're like i don't even remember i don't even know where that came from that just came through me. you know i had a night um with Robin Bateau and, and uh, a few other people that when we were playing, there's a, there's a thing called the Northeast regional folk Alliance. Yes, um, yeah. it's, it's, the abbreviation is NERFA. And they had, before the plague, they had uh, annual yeah, the uh, plague. get-togethers. It's a very um, good way to yeah, really. Yeah. And, and um, I, I assume they will again. And so I, I went to one, I, I think it was back in 2011, maybe. And we we felt Robin and I felt you know you never get to play enough you you have a showcase and that's like twenty minutes mm-hmm. and you're there for four days <laughs> and yeah you can play in the hall but you know I, and, that, and that's fun there's nothing wrong with playing in the hall if you're playing with good people but we we've got a brilliant idea said so let's take over let's talk to the organization see if we can't take over the bar for one night and we'll just have people that we like playing coming up and playing and if they want us to we'll accompany them 
And so uh, one of my favorite songwriters, a woman from Indiana named Krista Detour, she was she was there, and um, uh, oh, there were a bunch of other people, and we were just playing backup, and. I swear to God, I looked at my hands and I said, I don't think these hands are connected to my body. I mean, somebody else is pulling the strings. I mean, how I'm playing stuff that I haven't thought of before and I don't think I've thought of since. I said, maybe I'm playing too much. And then as I cut out some pieces, I said, everything, you, everything I played seemed to be right. And I've read books where other um, other musicians have had that happen. But you can't. Like you say, it's not a, it's not something that happens because you're controlling it. It's something actually, paradoxically, that happens when you look, stop controlling it. And and the great improvisers probably get that happening, you know, two nights out of three or whatever. But um, it's hard. I mean, it, yeah. I mean, it's it, it's to me. There's. I mean, I I think <clears throat> Duke Ellington said it or something. There's only two letters that separate magic and music, and that's kind of where it it you know that's kind uh-huh. of where it comes into play. And I. You know, Dave, I wanted to ask you, when I interviewed, um, I've done a bunch of interviews, well, you know I've done a bunch of interviews, but one Ooh. one with, uh, I've done several with the the, uh, the great engineer and also fantastic musician, Dan Healy, who was the, the sound cat for The Grateful Dead, and he said, Oh, right, okay. He said that the, the pivotal group that does, I mean, their records are all over the place, you can go through dumps, you can go through any thrift store and find their records, but... He said the mm-hmm. first group, folk group, that really introduced um, world music to the to the to the states was the Kingston Trio, Dave Gard, and they wow, and they and they brought in. It wasn't ethnic percussion. It wasn't like per, you know like different instruments from around the world, which came later. It was more like the songwriting, the the old world songs from Europe. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. And and I just wanted to know, was it was it the Queskin Jug Band? I mean, you were not a professional uh, in 65, but I just wanted to know who you got off on, like, in that early well, 60s got, period. Well, you know, uh, I started, uh, I played piano as a kid, and I had a rock and roll band in high school like everybody else. And, um, but I was in New York, uh, growing up in New York, and I, somebody turned me on to the the scene on on Sundays Sunday afternoons in the village where they'd empty out the fountain and there would be 300 of your favorite local folk singers gathered in knots of five or ten or fifteen you know and and there'd be all these songs going on and you could go from group to group until you found a song you liked and there were probably several people playing there who later became famous but you know uh, for me I mean I'm, I'm a 15 year old kid I noticed that a lot of the people with guitars were talking to a lot of women and uh, right. I said this is for me I got right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I learned I, I picked up the guitar and then that way if you remember I don't know if you you might have read about that there, 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 was, there was this like this what Dave Van Rock used to call a folk scare he said there's one every 50 years or something <laughs> like that um, I love that and I used to say in my introduction to a song you know that 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 for one hour on a Sunday afternoon in April, folk music was a viable commercial entity. And in the cosmic irony of my life, it was during that hour that I made a career choice. Wow! And um, wow! So I was I was taken by certainly the Kingston Trio, and and, and you know the, I, I like to say that because there's so little turnover in in who the aristocracy of the genre is. Yes. That. I was able to grow up and meet and write songs with and play with and play, uh, you know, jam with all of the people that got me into it in the first place. The day I really became uh, a folk junkie was at Brown. There was a television show called Hootenanny, and they used to go to college campuses once a week. This was because folk music uh, had become popular between the Kingston Trio and the Limelighters and the Chad Mitchell Trio and and then Judy Collins and, uh, sure. you know, and then the whole, the whole Cambridge scene with Dylan and Joan Baez. And Absolutely. And Tom Rush. And, and, and all of those people, um, they weren't in it for the quick, for the quick buck. I mean, they, they were in it cause they loved it and they kept doing it and they kept doing it by the time I grew up. Oh, I was going to tell you about who did So they come to Brown and they let us sit in the hall all day long while they rehearsed. And there was you know, Judy was there, and the Clancy brothers, and Theodore Raquel, and and um, Ian and Sylvia, and wow. Uh, wow. a few other people, and and uh, 
and I got to watch this. And by the end of that night, I said, I, I got to do this. And so, uh, you know, I started playing in folk groups and, and, um, I thought, wow, this is, this is great. I'll be a big star. And, <laughs> you know, we turn, we were like, we were like beached whales the moment the wave receded <laughs> and, um, you know, <laughs> folk, what, you know, boogies, you moron. And, uh, oh, you know, this. so, but, but it was, uh, it was a community and then, and it, it has, and it also was tied in with, you know, with politics, left wing activism and stuff like that, which I was attracted to. And, and, um, so what you know, let me you ask you a up... question for somebody that wasn't on the planet i mean i've talked to <clears throat> i mean music really used to dictate our culture and it, it doesn't really anymore it it, it, it in, in the sense of it, it was a social conscious it's folk music especially i mean i i mean you can go albert eiler coltrane those guys were also expressing anguish and and doing it in an in a instrumental fashion but if you with if, reason Absolutely, because I we can't put ourselves in those shoes. But you know, what was in your mind the what were the driving issues for you at that time? I mean, considering that, I just find that you know when you look at Black Lives Matter or you look at any of these uh, groups that are trying to do essentially uh, you know moral uh, work, uh, the one thing I find always lacking. Is the music? There's no music component to it. I mean, uh, you know, Angela Davis would get up at a Black Panther rally, and you know, they'd have Hugh Masekela blowing with his band. You know, I mean, there was wow. always a yeah. there was always a musical and folk music, especially. And I guess just for my generation and younger cats, like, what for you were the the issues that meant the most to you that you tried to maybe put into your writing? Well, as a, as a as an adolescent, mostly I was parroting the views of people that I had come to like and respect. You know, sure. um, I remember one time I was sitting, um, uh, Robin and I were opening for Pete Seeger and Arlo Guthrie. It was outdoors. I want to say Meriwether Post Pavilion, but I'm wow, not sure. Wow, dude, that is so I, ridiculous, I think it, yeah. dude. Seeger. I, I, it, yeah. Seeger, and, and man. So between, between the... Um, the uh, the sound check and the concert, there was like a dinner break and where there were picnic tables outdoors and we're we're all sitting at this picnic table, and um, I asked Pete, you know, can you tell me anything about the Peace Kill riots and you know, they were in 1948. Absolutely, I, was I know those I was, well. Yeah, I didn't, you know, and he started telling me about it. And part of my mind is listening, of course, to what he's saying, and then another part of my mind is. You're hearing history from the guys who made it. Right. You know, you, this is like talking to somebody who just stepped off a stamp. Um, <laughs> it, it, it was it was just so. So when I was a kid, yeah, we we we'd hear about things like that, and we'd hear about Huac going around, and you know, this was the age of uh, not too long after McCarthy. That's right. And um, and you know, so we were aware of uh, the battle lines, but it was. I don't think it was. I mean, big time music uh, uh did it really adopt protest i'm talking about large commercial music before bob dylan i mean was he the vanguard because there were people like oh john baez was probably the first one who was more at least noted as much for political activism as for uh music but it was folk music i mean it was the folk musicians who were the lefties and to the degree that we were politically conscious at all we were lefties so I don't know. What no, I, I want I, this is I want to read this quote to you because <clears throat> uh, you alluded to it a little bit in the before we went on, on the air. He, it said um, this is from uh, my interview. I got a chance to go to his house in Eugene, Oregon, was Mason Williams. He said the two people I met in my life who I thought were great men were Pete Seeger and Ken Kesey. Not only were they wow. were they clever and could write great songs and great books, they were able to embrace all of humanity, warts and all. I guess you might say all kinds of people would come to Ken's house and visit and talk and they were welcome. Pete Seeger was always trying to improve the welfare of the common man. It was the broad, yep. the broad love of humanity. There's footage of him standing out in the snow on a street corner, singing songs about peace. You don't want to be clever. <laughs> you also want to be magical, you know? And like, I mean, Chuck Israels, who was a bass player on those Van Ronk records and also played with, Bill Evans and like uh -huh. you know, I mean he 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 was in 1950. His parents were communists. They were in Massachusetts, and he was singing with Pete Seeger 
at, you know, 10 years old. It seems to me like the music just, because it was, because we were still generally more of an auditory society, TV had not really, I mean, it was around, but it was really pretty antiquated, especially considering today's terms. And it just seems to me like, you know, those messages and those lyrics within the songs made our, made the people a lot more hip to what was going on. I mean, they could at least see through and they could detect what was authentic. You could see that, you know, Blind Willie Johnson or the Reverend Gary Davis, all these guys. I mean, I mean, th- th- that was the truth. These guys had no teeth. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, folk, folk music uh, in the late 50s, I mean, first of all, before it became commercially a thing, I mean, I guess the Weavers broke through in the late 40s, early 50s. But the Weavers were always being, you know, assaulted by the right and by Huack and, and, and you know, it, it, the battle lines were clearly drawn, and it, 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 you know, went back. It had its its roots with Woody Guthrie in the in the thirties and and Lead Belly, and you had to learn about these figures. I mean, Pete, Pete was so goddamn human. I mean, he was. Um, he, 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 he I don't know if I could say this on the radio. Go ahead. Yeah, you can say anything. We're not. There's no FCC. Okay. Here. Well, he, he, he was making a point about sexism, and he sang a song called Show Us the Length of Your Cock. <laughs> and I, was, I almost swallowed my gum. I said, wait. Is this Dude, the man was, was naked to he the world. He was a real guy. Jeez. Yeah, he, 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 was just, he was just an icon. And, oh, and, my um, God. But, but, but all of them, I mean, Chad Mitchell Trio did a lot of political stuff. And then the other side of my upbringing, uh, which I did not, practice unfortunately in those years which i'm trying desperately in my dotage to to learn something about was jazz because i had a a friend who ended up being a jazz promoter he was a fanatic i mean he'd take me to i saw everybody including billy holiday um you're talking about jack kleinsinger that's right yeah because you don't because i'm just going to drop this right on you right now my dad is richie feinberg Get out of here! I knew it. I knew you didn't. I was going to ask. Yeah, no, you. I, dude. I, I'm, I, 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 I wait, dude. I'm I, telling I you. Swear to God, we are having wait, such wait, a ball. I, like, I, 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 yeah. No, I was telling my dad. My dad and I were. We, he's here. Oh he's in Tucson God. right now. So we were talking about it, and I'm like, Please I don't think Bus. I will. I, I said I don't he's think one Buskin of the knows. People I ever. He's like I don't think Buskin knew that I am his son. But yeah, dude, Larry. We were talking. I was going to ask you if you knew Richard or or um. A Larry Feinberg. Of course, my uncle. Yeah, um, I mean, they're my they're my people, and, man. And I said, I said to myself, "Don't be a schmuck." You know, there's a million Feinbergs. You know. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, man. No, it's so good. That's why I was saying that on so many levels, it's so great to connect with you because my dad used to talk. You know, and and, and really, he he. Uh, I when I talked, I, you know, he's he. They flew in last night. You know, I, they their grandparents. They love their grandkids, and they're hanging out and and. Uh, and I'm sitting there with him, and I actually, you know, he's like outside of a few camp reunions. You know, I get, I, I, I haven't spent a lot of time with Dave. He said that the best thing, the memories about you are that as a camp counselor, you were the best. I mean, you would come over after he excelled at a color war game, be so encouraging, so fired up. And you'd be playing songs during Color War. You'd write songs, prolific stuff, you know. Oh, man. Yeah, at Wabagoon. Oh, but when you so Klein Singer yeah. was a gateway for me early on in the sense that he I could call him up and all these sort of mercurial, amazing studio musicians, uh, he would just open the directory and give me their phone numbers. And so that when I that showed, when I started that's, my show ten years ago. He was, yeah. And so tell me let's well, go, he's, tell me about Klein Singer. I never met a bigger jazz fan than Klein Singer. He did his 20 years working for the city as a corporation council, and then he retired. Right. He, I guess he was still in his 40s, and he became a jazz promoter, and he's got this series called Highlights in Jazz that he consistently lost money on, but he's managed to keep it a lot for 50 years, or almost 50, I guess. And, you know, he, he I'll, I'll give you a Klein Singer example. Yeah. He, he takes me to a thing called the Randall's Island Jazz. Oh, Festival. my God. The thing was seven hours. I mean, <laughs> a million of your favorite jazz, and and one of the one of the kickers of it was the, the MCs were Lam, Lambert Hendricks and Ross, wow. and they would do. The, I don't know if they were writing them on the spot, but they couldn't because the arrangements were, were were too sophisticated for that. But they would sing a little ditty about the next performer, and they did it for like seven, eight, nine performers. It was amazing, and so it's seven hours. He's driving home. 
And on the way home to the Bronx, he turns on Symphony Sid on the radio because he wants to hear more jazz. I thought, you know, I like jazz, but this guy really likes jazz. Well, and I, I think and, that that um, is uh, – well, you know, this is a great segue. I mean, I, I, we, have a, we, we have a game on this program called Name That Voice, and I, I don't expect you to know who this is, but it pertains – I that, couldn't name my bandmate, Jeff Campton. For, you know. Don't worry. No, no. The, j- just uh, take a listen to this, to this and it, it pertains okay. to what you're talking about with Client Singer. We'll come back. Well, it, it, it meant a form of music that was harmonically complex and very beautiful and very, and very uh, it, it was a work of art. I, I remember the first time I heard a, a solo by Wes Montgomery. It, it was just, um, it was so beautiful, but I, I didn't understand it. And at the same time, I, I really loved it. I wanted, I wanted to know what it was. Talking to Larry Coriel here um, from oh, Florida. Um, wow. can, when you talk about America's only indigenous music, I've talked to so many cats about uh, the origins of the word jazz uh, and where mm-hmm. it, wh- do you do you do you believe it's it's not just the only indigenous american music but is it a is it a, is it a black american music it's african, well, it's, a, it's, it's african a hybrid based. It's mostly it's definitely an african um, phenomenon uh, but you don't have to be african american to play it but you have to understand that it, it comes from that culture can you can you be more specific about how it's African based? Well, it's derived from uh, the way black people hear music, and from the way the way they compose forms like work songs and hollers and field hollers, and and uh, ultimately it evolved into the blues, and the blues was. Uh, Pretty, pretty much the foundation of all the forms in jazz that became expressed by composers like Billy Strayhorn and Duke Ellington, etc. Fletcher Henderson, etc. But it was it was not just a blues like people think might think of the blues as I don't know BB King or uh, something relatively simple. You know, the blues evolved out of a very long period of suffering by uh, African-American people. And then it's it, it was like out of a muddy, wet, dank swamp <laughs> of culture. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. These beautiful flowers mm. from that, they were fertilized by, uh. by that life um, of of complexity and uh, difficulty and the beautiful flowers of, of, of music that were original. These things, you know, they grew forth out of that mud. Thank you for listening to that, Dave. I, I, I mean, rest in peace, Larry Coriel. He's, I mean, he's talking about flowers growing out of this muddy, dank swamp. And, um, well, and I and I, I, I mean, and I want you know because it's Klein Singer. The, the the thing is he he has this and I give him mad props because I have DVDs of him back in seventy one with Roy Haynes and Bernard Purdy and all these guys. It's insane, but you know like jazz, everybody you we, me and you could walk down the streets of New York today and ask people what is jazz and we get twenty different answers, and it's like that term I terms in music. They, 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 to me, it's all music. And I, I feel like, especially in jazz, like, like labels have really stratified the ability for musical vocabulary to grow. At the time that you were digesting this stuff, it was much more loose and the blues were much right, were right alongside jazz. And I, I just really wanted you to talk about what your, now that you're sort of ensconced in it with your teacher and you're, you're getting your chops together, that you know, what is your concept of that word jazz? Well, certainly the blues, I mean, it's an Afrocentric art and it comes from the uh, African-American experience and, and the blues is at the heart of jazz to my mind. But 
to me, the apotheosis of American music was the con- when, when when African musicians combined with the compositions and songs of immigrant, mostly Jewish composers. Right. Um, you know, I, I would rather hear um, uh, Lester Young play a, a, a Gershwin song than just about anything. Yeah, you know? a, you're right. That's it's, a very it's, good point. It's, yeah. it's, it's just, um, it's, it's so evocative and it's so brilliant. And I'm, I, I love hearing great jazz players play standards. That, that, that that's uh, yeah. It's just, well, because also, me, you know, but that's the magical nice. thing, man. They, because they made it their own, right? I mean, you know, you you, yeah, look, sure. you, you any of those guys. I mean, Strayhorn or Train. I mean, they took those standards when they left the head of the tune. It kind of could be any tune. You didn't even know what it was, yeah. but then they bring it back. You know, you never got too yeah. far away. Yeah. It never got too fusiony or anything. I just wonder, like, I mean, in my mind, when I was like when I connected with you. You know, I mean, obviously you were in the folk bag, so to speak, but I just, I'm like, this guy had, I'm like, Buskin had to be going to the Village Gate to see Miles or like, oh yeah. I mean, can you talk about some seminal moment? Because those guys, to me, Mingus, I mean, Mingus called his music Mingus music. He didn't want to call it (laughs) because jazz was distrusted. There were were really good places then that you could go to hear all those giants. I mean... Uh, I saw Mingus at the five spot, which was I think so a legendary. Mark's place. And so legendary. There was the half note on Hudson Street, um, of course, where you know for like seven or eight bucks you could get here amazing music and you could get a decent dinner. Um, you know, and then then that got older and uh, you know like one I was it wasn't my prom, it was somebody at some girl's prom that I took. And anyway, we ended up at Basin Street East, and uh, we saw. Uh, uh, Joe Bushkin, and in fact, uh, I uh, I got a good seat by telling the guy I was. I said, "My name is David Buskin, but it used to be Bushkin, and I'm Joe's cousin." <laughs> so give me a good seat. <laughs> I, I mean, forgot about that. I mean that. I, but I, the girl was very impressed. Oh, I love it. I I mean, so you. I mean, did you tell me a little bit as being a professional as a singer songwriter, like? I always talk to my older daughter about, you know, she's she's got a, a lot. She's got great time feel on the piano. She um, she can play the notes on the page, and I'm always, you know, I, obviously you read my my the transcriptions of these interviews, and I'm always just mm-hmm. throw the book away, be yourself, play to the heavens, yeah. go for it. I mean, can you talk about how you? over time in your career have learned to stretch out and, you know, not improv. No one's going to be John Coltrane, but how did you learn to improvise? Cause I think that that is like a, an incredible, that was always yeah. something I wanted to do. I did very little of it in my performances because the, 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 the genre that I was in didn't, and, and also my technical limitations didn't really allow me to. And then, um, I guess it was about 10, 12 years ago, I, re- I don't remember exactly, but uh, I, I was going to this guy for a guitar. He was a guitar tech, and he was fixing something, and I said, you don't happen to know a good teacher, do you? He said, yeah, there's a guy right across the street, Joe Giglio. And I went to this guy, Joe Giglio, and I said, he said, what are you looking to do? And I said, well, I'd, I'd like to be in my heart of hearts. I'd like to learn how to play some jazz and improvise on standards and stuff like that. I love it. And like I say, that was that was maybe a dozen years ago. And when I couldn't even pick out a melody uh, when I started, um, I think it was da, 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 Body and Soul, you know. And a, after working with him for about half an hour, I had the I had the head. But it it's a constant, you know. You have to acquire the technical skill, you know, to be able to to even think about improvising because. You got to have the chords in your head, and you got to, you know, unless you're just a natural genius, and all you got to do is pick up the instrument. But unfortunately for me, I'm not one of those. So let me ask you though, if you and when you were when you were on the circuit, (laughs) touring or what or playing gigs, like was it frown? Even if I mean, even if you had minimal chops, whatever, like was it frowned upon in the folk scene to stretch out at all? You couldn't stretch out. Oh no, 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 not at all. I mean, the the, the great instrumentalists, especially the bluegrass guys. I mean, you know that that was all. Oh my God, I mean, dude. Bill Keith. A, a player I mean, like 
yeah, a, a player like Tony Rice was right. in his way. Uh, you know, he sure. was he was one of the uh, one of the giants, the same way Coltrane was in jazz. It was just a a different different coat, totally different, not totally different, but it was a different emphasis in the in the in the genre. But I played, you know, sometimes in the mid seventies, I, I started getting some gigs backing up singers, and those allowed me to stretch a little. I had acquired some piano. This was on piano. I'd acquired some piano technique in, I did a summer semester at, at Berkeley. I, I used to tell my daughter, uh, you know, it was easy back then. It was only three chords and, you know. You <laughs> no, that's what I want. I'm so glad you brought that up. You went to, was it the Schillinger house when you went there? Because it, because no, in 69 or was, when, because I could not no, believe. No, it was the yeah. summer of, it was the summer of 66. They had a 12 week summer. Oh course. my, that's so I had ridiculous. Graduated I had graduated from Brown, but I wasn't going for a, a higher degree, so the Army didn't consider it a school. They wouldn't give me a student deferment sure. until I got drafted. But but that summer, I did. I moved up to Boston, did 12 weeks at Berkeley, and I learned most of what I know um, formally about the music. And they told me as soon as I got there, I had a professor who I think is just retired. You know, he, he was a young Turk when I was there. And he became an immunologist. Know, his name was Ted Tease, and uh, wow. he said wow. the first day, he said, "There's only two kinds of music: there's good music and there's bad music." And so, you know, and and, and of course, we were all into categorization. I don't know why that always became such a. You, you a you're telling me? Okay, I want to be clear. That's also uh, the Duke Ellington School is it's all music, and then the subjective part is either it's good or bad. But you were already into yeah. the labels had already gotten their teeth in. You guys were already oh god with that? Yeah. yeah you know I remember when I started going to concerts in high school when Kleinsing was taking me to see uh, you know Monk and Mingus oh, and Dizzy and god. like that then I became a real snob and it, it, <laughs> it, 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 well it coincided with a really arid period for pop music I mean who wears short shorts you know right. it was pre right. just before. Um, the explosion uh, that that changed the face of popular music, Absolutely. Dylan and the Beatles and the Beach Boys and the Supremes, and and um, you know a million others, Chuck Berry. Well, Chuck Berry had been around, but um, he was a major you know, influence. It, Chuck Berry had no problem playing in seven four. That dude was insane. He was the yeah, man, and and he, he was one of those amazing talents. I don't, you know, he was apparently wasn't a real sweet guy because I have some good <laughs> stories, but they're too long. But um. Um, it's okay. No, I mean, uh, I mean, it was a, it was an arid time, so it opened the door. I mean, you were getting to see these masters of jazz, yeah, like, I didn't, like I, up I was close. Too stupid to know. I'll tell you one story that was yeah. fun. Um, just give you an idea of the breadth of these minds. Um, I told you I mentioned Lambert Hendricks and Ross. Sure, they had an album that came out. It was, I was in the Columbia Record Club. That was a thing where they sent you. Dude, it was an it was uh, essential, an man. Dude, you get like ten records, man. Every yeah. day. it was unreal. Yeah, yeah, you got a bunch up front, and then they'd send you one every month. And it, it was, the deal was, if you didn't like it, you, you could send it back and then <laughs> credit you. Anyway, so the first this album was called the hottest new group in jazz. It was Lambert Hendricks and Ross. And I'd never heard any singing like that before. I didn't know about Eddie Jefferson. And, and I just hadn't heard that kind of stuff. And it, it blew my mind. And so years later, it turns out I'm taking vocal lessons from the same voice teacher that John Hendricks is. Oh. And I, I, I knew he, he studied with Judith, but I, I, you know, I, I was just kind of hoping. And so one day I'm walking down the hall in her building and coming towards me is John freaking Hendricks. And I'm saying, you got to say something. And then I'm saying, don't say something stupid. You know, don't make a fool of yourself, <laughs> but just say something, you know, because it's John Hendricks. And I don't know what came over me, but what came out of my mouth was, I think it was a B flat and an A. I went, we know, which is from a song on that album called Charleston. Charleston Alley, and there's a little bit of contrapuntal fun where wow. uh, he he goes, one of them goes, we know, and the others go, tell us about what you know, where to play, tell us about where to go, and we'll show, you don't know what time it takes, you the way, looking for what shakes, it's, it's a back and forth, and it's fun, and I just went, we know, and without missing a breath, the guy goes, Tell us about what you know. And he must have known <laughs> Dude, 40,000 songs. Oh. And he knew as soon as he heard that, his mind went into auto, par, auto lock. 
and he sang, and we sang the whole whole verse. You know, I went, how to play? He went, tell us about what you know. And we just, and then we cracked up and high fived. And I said, this is one of the great moments of my life. Uh, so <laughs> I'm, I, I, we have documented that story now. I mean, this is what. First of all, I got to send you my interview with him because he, we, rest in peace. The man is oh. st- beyond genius. I mean, he, but he basically said, I mean, he said. <laughs> growing, he was in Toledo playing at the Waiters and Bellman's Club with Art Tatum, and it was a dry town. And the Sicilians would be running liquor into that town. He goes without the Sicilian. He goes without the Sicilians. There'd be no jazz in America. He said they didn't. He said they didn't treat us. He said they didn't treat us like niggers. He said they they recognized our genius. They paid us very well. And and without them, there'd be no jazz. I that he is funny. total avatar, man. Like I I, I just you know I'll I mean tell you a follow up. Go ahead. No, years yeah. later, a friend of mine who knew him said, you know, they're going to do. He and his daughter Aria are going to do a uh, a thing at Birdland. This is the new Birdland, not the old one. Sure. And and uh, this was like eight ten years ago, and they they're auditioning people to do the Dave Lambert part. So I said, I got, I got to get an audition. And, and, and I did. And turns out there's no charts. I mean, if you know that music, the idea of learning it with no charts, and it, that was before, um, you know, before you, you could slow things down digitally and stuff like sure. that. I was listening to a CD trying to pick up the part on Baby Come On, Come on Home. And, you know, it took me three days to get two songs, um, you know, and then I go in for the audition and it was magical. I'm singing the Dave Lambert part, including a fairly complex solo with John and his daughter, and they're videotaping it. And I would give my life to get my hands on that video. Wait a minute. Anyway, okay, so I want to be clear. You, after that high five, you guys kind of connected a little bit. Like, I mean, he. No, 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 no. This was this. He didn't remember that. This was this was years later. Sure. It was just by another route, life threw me in John Hendricks' path. That's and, and, so and you got the gig, and you got the gig. I would have gotten the gig, but it turns out I couldn't make the gig because I had another gig. This was like two weeks right. before the gig. I couldn't do it. I couldn't hang up the group I was in, and, and, and I wrestled with it. But I said, but 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 uh, it, it was almost moot because I don't see how I could have learned the whole book from CDs in that available <laughs> amount of time. There were no charts. I, I mean, love them. Like, you know, no charts, dude. All the, I mean, you know, this yeah. was like. You got to learn a whole, a whole uh, uh, alto, a whole Charlie Parker solo on your own. I mean, it, forget it. I mean, I could do it, but it would have taken me until about now. Um, so, but it was such a thrill to sing. You know, I mean, I was, I, I, you know, again, where your mind goes, part of your mind is watching yourself and going, you're like a five-year-old kid. Saying, I can't believe it. I'm singing this part and I'm singing the right notes and it's with John Hendricks and his daughter. You know, it, it was it was unbelievable, and I've had I've been fortunate to have a lot of experiences where my mind is going, look at what you're doing, you know. Right, it's almost so, like you're watching yourself you know, on the side of the stage, almost in yeah. you're like watching this in disbelief. And it's hard not to, you know, because I can get down and say, well, I didn't really get to where I wanted to go in terms of a fame and fortune. I mean, I made a bunch of money, but it wasn't quite in the same business it was in the jingle business i mean no no kid when he's 15 years old says i can't wait to get older and write 30 second songs about you know hey man dude i gotta tell you something right now man i mean come on i mean i'm very good friends with guys like mike mayneri and steve gadd those those freaking guys man alan schwartzberg every it doesn't matter yeah no i mean alan's like alan's i still have a i still have a brown yarmulke Velvet Yamaka from his wedding. I Dude, uh, I'm, tell- I'm telling I'm telling you he is going to be cracking. I'm t- I wanted to ask you about that. <clears throat> First of all, Jink, there's nothing to listen in music. Think about the Jazzers, man. How many of those guys th- that's the most impressive thing about Dizzy. Monk was I don't do you think Monk was misunderstood in his time? Did you understand his genius? I, 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 most geniuses are uh, of course. Of course. Of course. Population. Um, you know, I, I listened to, there's a guy in Chicago, um, uh, Denny Zeit. Yeah, it's a dear, Denny, he, he, he's a dear friend too. Yeah. Uh, what's his last, Zeitlin? Denny's, he's, yeah, out, he's out, he's out, he's out, in, he's out in Northern Cali. He's a psychiatrist and a, yeah, dude, the guy was ridiculous player. He plays Monk like it's Monk. Um, it, it's just, I can't, I can't 
fathom brains like that. I, I you cannot know, wait people, to send you this. I can oh, my God, you're going to die when I send you this. No, I, you but I, what I want to say, like, the guys that were able to do what they love to do and make a living doing it would be amazing. Yeah. But most of the guys, I mean, Alan told me he was at the half note playing – uh, he would be playing behind, you know, behind Zoot Sims and Al Cohn, or he was playing with. Wait, Luke. Alan did? Oh yeah, oh big time! I got to send you those interviews. Alan was a stone. Holy cow! Richie Kamuka, he won. He was, and then in ni- yeah. in nineteen seventy, he was like, um, I'm making twelve bucks a week playing with Randy Brecker and Lou Tabak, and I got to make. And he and he got into R and B, and you know the rest is history. <laughs> but the thing I wanted to ask you about, <clears throat> this is really important. Um. On he used to treat her this album by by uh, Dave Buskin. Now, um, my dear friends Bob Mann and Alan Schwartzberg are featured as part of the rhythm section, but most of the cats, unfortunately, were guys that I was unable to get to because they've all kind of passed away. Which were these these uh, Nashville cats? So how the Nashville guys? The Nashville. So so did did Schwartzberg and Mann overdub on stuff, or did you did you split the session between? No, I did a couple of tracks. It, it was that that album was such a hash up. I mean, it, I can't wait I, to get my hands on it. it. I need to get my hands on a I, copy of that. I'll send it to you. Send me. The, I, I need it, dude. With, uh, I, I um, wait a minute. Now I started it in Nashville because it was my second album. The first one had been produced by Norbert Putnam in Nashville, and Norbert started to produce the second one, and then I think he he got jammed up. I think he was doing uh, either it was either Fogelberg or, or sure. Uh, Jimmy Buffett. Um, anyway, so the arranger Glenn Spreen, he took over the production, and then but I did some tracks in New York with the late Elliot Mazur. Um, and it was funny. Are you kidding me, dude? That he, dude he is a freaking a, avatar, man. But he had such a different take. I mean, you know, with Glenn, you know, we we would, and the Nashville guys, you know, they they. You just give them a chart with Roman numerals, and they were happy. Yes, the, <laughs> you know, the, the joke is, dude. Good. I'm telling you, you dude, these to... guys were shamans. I, I'm looking Feral Morris, uh, oh yeah, Norbert sure. Putt, M- Buttry. Charlie, oh, so, how about Charlie Charlie McCoy on piano on harmonica? Are any of those Briggs cats still with piano? us? Are they all gone? Are they with David them? Briggs and Norbert? David and Norbert are still. Oh my like, dude, I, I dude, I, you um, are. Uh, this is so. Wait, I just want to be. Norbert wrote. Yeah. You should interview Norbert. No, I need I need you to hook me up with Norbert immediately, dude. Okay, yeah, dude, this well, is so, he, so, yeah. He was so low key. I mean, this is a guy who played bass for Elvis for crying out loud, and he <laughs> he came out of Muscle Shoals, and uh, oh my god, his mother didn't Jeez. want him to go to Nashville because she didn't want him to quit the telephone company. He was making a steady seventy five bucks a week, right? And she thought he was you know taking too many chances, and he, you know, a, a couple of years later, he and all these other guys are just. I mean, they would. You go come to the session, and where's Norbert? Where's Glenn? Oh, they went out to Hawaii with Buffy for a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, isn't that special? Where's my album? You know. Tell me, um, tell me about Mazer's. But, tell me about Mazer's Mazer, uh, Mazer philosophy liked, in the studio. What he liked is turn the mics on. You guys play the song. That's it. I love know? that. Shit. And so. We'd start playing, and you know something, and then he just waited for the lightning to strike. And and there was one tune I think it was called Trails, where at the time we thought it was, uh, you know, we thought it was Night Train. We thought it was just we'd made history. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> You're not necessarily we the best so judges of that, but yeah, of, yeah, yeah. We yeah. were just so high off of what had happened. You know, sometimes you confuse the 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 outcome with the experience. Sure, you know? absolutely. I, I've noticed it's not always. You come off the stage, you think, "Wow, I killed that set," and then and people are like, "Yeah, that was pretty good." You know, and there's sometimes you think, "Oh, I made so many mistakes," and people are coming up saying, "That was amazing. That was one of your best shows." I've ever seen. You're not the best judge. Always, that's well, that's a whole other spiritual component to the whole thing. You know, that is. Yeah, you're grooving on on what your brain was feeling at the time, you know, and and you think, "Oh, I'm making history tonight," and then they say, "Well, you know." You better watch it for. A well, no, but that's the. I mean, there's there's other things about like you know. Like I remember a dear friend of mine, uh, the drummer Chris Parker, who was the original drummer. Oh, sure. You know, and stuff, and he's a dear. I think Chris is brilliant, dude. And Chris is ridiculous, and he he told me this story in one of our interviews where he was at a he went down to do an Alan Two Saints session, and uh, and he was in a Howard Johnson with the other cat that was in the that was doing the uh-huh. session, and the guy had pneumonia. And so uh, during the the that process, uh, uh, Chris contracted it, and he's flying back to New York, uh, and he has said he's, he had never felt 
like that. Hello? He, he, you still there? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. He, yeah. he had never... He was flying back to New York. He was flying back to New York, and he felt like death. He thought he was... I mean, he never felt like that in his life. And everyone was like, you got to go to the hospital. You got to go to the hospital. But that night at McKell's, um, you know, it was him. He was the original drummer and stuff. He had brought Gad in, Cornell Dupree, Gordon Edwards. He couldn't miss the gig. He went to the gig. He's he All he could think about was getting through the gig. He was literally yeah. dying. With that. Yeah. He gets off the stage, right? And people are coming up to him and saying, dude, I've never heard you play. That was insane the way you played. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like when you get out of your own, I mean, again, that was just physical limitations, being sick, fatigue. That's so funny. It's, you know, and it's just, it's similar to, anyway, I didn't want to cut you off. I mean, it's like. The, no, no, I mean, I, you reminded me, I mean, you know, yeah. I don't know if this is a free range interview, but you reminded me the first, the first jingle, first time I got a jingle produced, you know, I walk into the studio and yeah, yes, it's, 60 second song but the people playing it are, are chris parker and will lee oh my Davis god Davis. dude what was that oh, what was the jingle you got to tell me the jingle dude what was the jingle oh god dude, now you, you look no i i suds remember. and duds uh, or tie it, it, no it, i it didn't get it was it never got final i think it was, oh my uh, god this is so might great. have been for sears oh you know, my god, god dude wait will lee but, and but, c I'm, parker I'm, dude i love it and and i said it was an, uh, here goes my mind again you say look at this look who's playing your song and and there was all charts then too and they're making you know corrections and the producer uh who had perfect pitch she was saying um uh, oh, I think you, you, the the A string is a little flat, David. You know, and it, was like, it was it was just I, I was catapulted into a world of musical expertise that I had only read about. Oh my god! You but know, these I guys, mean, you know, the, you, you're just it's just the, you guys. One reason I love your generation, it's just like, I mean, there were plenty of assholes out there. Don't get me wrong, but I I mean a lot of beautiful. Human beings. Huh. I mean, Chris, Chris Parker, Parker is like the greatest man. He's, too, yeah. he's too, too nice to be that good. Dude, he's like, I mean, I've interviewed his father. All his dad did was paint, hang out with Jeremy Steig's father, William, and listen to <laughs> listen to Monk records and and Mink. It was, I mean, the guy. Oh was, there's a reason, and and all the brothers were playing drums growing. I think Chris had a strip club gig in Connecticut when he was 11 years old. I mean, it's it's <laughs> insane, and he's just so modest and beautiful. Anyway, I just. To me, like I found my voice through these guys, through 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 the Buzzy Feetons, and through the Chris Parkers, and through the St you know they went there with me. They helped me get you know I can listen back to my interviews with Richard Davis and Jack DeJunet when I first started ten years ago, and I'm sort of like stumbling through the questions. I know what I want to ask, but I can't really <laughs> not confident enough to say it. And and you know they they just they just I mean I I'm pretty relentless too, but. They, I mean, this these musicians <laughs> help me find my voice, man. I mean, these are beautiful people. It's, it's all you're as you're saying. I mean, the, the the thrust of this is that it's all of a piece. That's right. You know, it's 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 like there's this uh, sacred river, and we're all dipping our feet in. And I want to be very clear, man. I don't. I can't read. I mean, I if I can, like. <laughs> I don't read a lot either. Like that, Mary. Pr I want to talk to you. I mean, we're gonna have to do set two and set three. But I'm just saying that, like, yeah, because I'm gonna have. To yeah, it's fine. But I'm just saying, like, like I don't. I, I the books. <laughs> you wanted to be a beatnik so bad. I mean, I'm obsessed with this, this, <laughs> this uh, wavy gravy gaslight period. But oh, I, he had some good stuff in your interview. Yeah, dude, Hugh Romney. I mean, I, the the thing is that I was. I'm not. Uh, I've learned through just relentless amounts of interviews and then being able to put that into a print version but i just would like you to you know maybe we can wrap set one by just talking about you know the you know that you know beatniks kind of that that was the that was the tail end of the 50s they they were beboppers and and then the and the pranksters kind of fell in between the hippies and the beats but i just wanted you to talk yeah. about what was so intoxicating for you, well, don't forget the yeah. context. The context was, I mean, you know, this is an overview, and as such, it's probably wrong and missing a lot of details, certainly. But, you know, the 50s, America comes out of World War II as an economic colossus. Right. And for uh, white middle class people, the 50s were, you know, that's, uh, I think, what a lot of them are saying when they think of 
make America great again. They may think make America white again. That's well, right. That's absolutely right. People making people making trouble, and but it also was everybody expected progress. Everybody expected to do better in 1957 than they had in 56, and they expected, without a doubt, that their kids would be able to go to college and and buy cars and get a house and you know it was it was really leave it to beaver time and the eisenhower years and it was also quite repressive if you didn't happen to flow with the mainstream but um, and then what would it look like if it, when you say repressive what would because I mean, there was a lot of violence well, there was a lot of there was censorship yep, you know there yep. was, you know all kinds of censorship i mean i would so i would walk you know half a mile to get to the art house because they show cleavage you know they show french film um you know we're we're 14 year old raging hormones and 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 uh you know there there's no sex in right it's in all repressed that's right work. yeah that's right you know and and um and the I, beat and the beats yeah. were kind of pushing that they were pushing the line they were they the were beats were you know the beats were all about rebelling against in capital letters of the system and right. the man and you know, I mean, I wasn't into heavy drugs then, but um, uh, well, psychedelics were legal. Fact, yeah. I, well, but it, it wasn't even. I don't think this this was before. So when I was in high school, I remember I was playing with my high school band, and and uh, one of my friends came up and told me that somebody that he knew had smoked marijuana, and I was wow, really? <laughs> you know, that, you know, uh, we didn't. It was we were coming out of a, the great sort of blinders on innocent uh no nothing years so the beats were uh they were refreshing they were more than refreshing. they were intoxicating to us you know and, i mean i couldn't i couldn't make it through on the road i thought that was in the words of truman capote that's not writing that's typing um, interesting but um mm. but uh i i was i loved some of the other stuff and i tried to read the existentialist philosophers but I couldn't really understand. It. That's what like, and, like I'm, uh, it's very refreshing because my dad called you a genius, and for you not I'm to be out, please no, but when 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 like if you had a hard time reading it, I, all I'm saying is like to go back and actually extract information from the original pranksters and wavy stories. I mean, the idea that wavy gravy was taking. Jimmy Jufri, Jackie Byard, and Don Ellis <laughs> up, up to the Golden Lion in Hartford. That was the beginnings of of, of poetry and jazz. That's the Don that, Ellis had a big band. I remember doing a, a insane big kind band. Of con insane convention in, in it was in Minnesota, and you know the, like the various regions would have conventions of college buyers, and I was on one. Got a few gigs out of it too, but but I listened to his band. What the hell was that tune called? Boogie Whistle Stomp. Yeah. I don't know why I remember that. But it was, I mean, the time changed every four bars, you know. It was just Dude, it, it was like three, two drummers, and, three bass. It was insane. It was such a great sound. I mean, you know, I'll tell you, speaking of great sounds, what, what got me into jazz, Kleinsinger takes me to Birdland. The original Birdland. It was, yeah, on, on Broadway, downstairs. Wow. And it's, it's the bassy band with Jimmy Rushing. And, you know, Birdland, that Birdland was a, kind of a low ceiling room. It was there wasn't a lot of place for the sound to go except right at right at. Oh, that's great! That's so and, great to know. And to hear that big band, he loved big bands. Kleinsinger still does, but to hear that band, and then oh, Kenton band with the five trombones and that brass section. <sighs> Oh man, I, it just there were no more walls of martial lamps then. It not only was the loudest sound I'd ever heard, it was the loudest, finest sound I'd ever heard. And it was coming, you know, and it was coming hands. out. There were no monitors, so it was just coming out of. No, no, no. It, it, it was just you were twenty feet from the dance. Right. It was just it was natural ambient sound. I mean, that's unreal. Yeah. That's unreal. It, it, it and and you can imagine its effect on an impressionable kid who's trying to. Well, what's this all about? Holy shit! This is amazing. And, you know, so and, and the, the hipsters, the beatniks were into jazz and there was that connection. And then, you know, there was a it was like uh, remember there was a show called Doby Many Loves of Doby Gillis, where one of the characters, uh, Maynard Krebs, was a beatnik. You know, he was uh, I have to check that out. Like, I don't know that. Yeah, uh, it, it was it was a, if he I guess what I'm saying is if if the character of the beatnik made it into. Uh, parody, you know, where 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 mainstream sure. sitcom was 
was using it, that, that meant that they had had an impression. It's like the, it was it was it was the beginning of the counterculture. It was like besides the 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 political agitation on the part of oppressed groups, it was also cultural agitation because you know people were trying to squeeze your brain into you know very very narrow channels so when you know it was like when mad magazine started it was when gene shepherd what got on the radio oh he was a, he was a brilliant monologue monologist monologist yeah. um and, and uh you know anything that spoke of rebellion was was honey to the hive for us teenagers <laughs> um, you know hey, listen, anything but, but, that gave yeah. And maybe maybe at the bottom it was all about the girls and the turtlenecks, you know. I mean, <laughs> anything that got us close. Well, that was gonna close. that was only okay. gonna add to the to the honey, you know. But it's like it's just it's yeah. it's just it, it's let's you want to do part two next week? Set two? Sure. All right. Sure. Yeah, we got a lot more to get same to. Same time, same and, station. Yeah, well, okay. same time, hey, same give, station. Give my love to your father and your uncle, please. Yeah, dude, that, right back at you. We were talking, Wabagoon. What? What's what, like? Do you remember? Uh, like, do you feel like you found a little bit of your voice there? I mean, my dad said you were oh, singing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's... You couldn't help but grow up when you were that age. I mean, yeah, you know... My dad that was, My was, dad appreciated... I mean, he, he remembers having outstanding color war basketball games or things like that, and you, you running oh, yeah. over and, like, being like, great job, you know, patting him on the back. And, like, that... <laughs> I went to Scatico, great summer camp, and, uh, and that was, to me, like, seminal. When you had older people, not familial... Coming over, giving you mad props. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't be where I was to am today without without camp. It was unbelievable. Well, I, love, I love, yeah, I love being a counselor. I mean, it's like you know, it's you 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 feel like you're the old person when actually you're you're a kid too. You don't um, know what's going on, but you know. Anyway, let, let's continue this next week. You got it, brother. Great to hear you, man. Okay, Jake. Take care, I'll Dave. See you again later, dude. Bye. Bye. Very special um, engagement there, and uh, with Dave Buskin, a phenomenal singer, songwriter, and somebody who's continuing to uh, push themselves out of their comfort zone and grow as a musician. And uh, looking forward to set two with him. We'll be back tomorrow with a couple more interviews. That's it for the Jake Feinberg Show, and we will see you later. Mm-hmm.